Uh, If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, We're just reading verses 4 to 7. So this is actually the third sermon in a four-part series on this chapter. So I did uh, the middle part of this uh, passage last week, and uh, I'm doing the uh, verses 4 and 7 today. So 1 Corinthians 13, starting at verse 4. Paul writes, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I don't know if you know much about Jordan Peterson. He's a a trained clinical psychologist and has written a best-selling book called 12 Rules for Life. He speaks all around the world to packed out venues. He's published more than 100 scientific papers about alcoholism, antisocial behaviour, emotion, creativity and personality. His first book, Maps of Meaning, was a scholarly investigation into the nature of religious thought. He talks a lot about God, but he hedges around the question of whether he's a Christian. He's never come out and says, yes, I believe in Jesus. In his latest world tour, launching his new book, he says, the goal of life is to optimise your life. It's to make yourself a better person. But it was this comment that caught my attention. This was in an article about his latest Um, uh, tool launch, a book launch. It says, Peterson considers the optimisation of other people to be essential, but not because we generally care just as much about their optimisation as our own. Rather, it's because if we don't invest in their optimisation, they'll notice. They won't be as interested in being around us, and this will ultimately threaten our optimisation. For Peterson, love is ultimately self-serving. We don't love our neighbours as ourselves, we love them for ourselves. And I think that pretty much sums up how our culture defines love. In our culture, love is ultimately self-serving. We love people for our sake. We love people for what we get out of it, for how it makes us feel. In this series, we've been not only looking at the fact that at Christmas love came down, but we're looking at what sort of love came down. What is this love that came down at Christmas? In week one, we saw how love is everything, how love is better than speaking in angelic tongues, better than spiritual powers, and better than radical sacrifice. Last week, we saw that love isn't everything. There's certain things that love isn't. Next week, we're going to see that love is endless. But this morning, we're going to look at how love is exhibited. We're going to see seven characteristics of love put on display. We we bandy around the word love a lot. I love science fiction novels, I love bass, I love landscaping, I love Indian food, I love my wife and kids, I love Jesus, I love you guys. There, I said it again. It's a bit of a running joke. But what do we mean when we say the word love? What do you mean when you say you love Jesus or that you love your spouse? Well, we can still use the word love in a variety of ways, that's okay. But, but when we really get to the heart of what love means, what love is really about, I want to show you three things this morning. Firstly, that these characteristics of love are the characteristics of God. The Bible says God is love. God perfectly exhibits these characteristics of love because God is love. Secondly, I want to show that these characteristics of love are exhibited by Jesus. I'm getting ahead there. This morning we're going to see exactly what sort of love came down at Christmas. 
Thirdly, I want to show that if your love is self-serving in any way, it's not real love. The love that we are called to exhibit looks like the love that God showed us in Jesus Christ. If we were to put love on trial, how would you prove what love is? Well, in a trial, they bring out evidence. They say, look at exhibit B, look at exhibit A, and, and that shows that whoever is being charged with something is guilty. Well, let's see what love is guilty of. If you're going to charge love with something, let's put it on exhibit. So exhibit A, love is patient. The word patient literally means slow to anger. Love is slow to anger. It doesn't say it never gets angry. If you truly love someone, you will get angry about things. Seeing your loved ones being hurt or abused is meant to make you angry. If you don't get angry at injustice, it exhibits a lack of love. Rather, love is slow to anger. Anger is not love's first response. Instead of getting angry straight away, it takes a long time for love to get angry. Instead of being thin-skinned, love is thick-skinned. Repeatedly, the Bible says that God is patient. God is slow to anger. When, when God reveals himself, his glory to Moses at Mount Sinai, he declares, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The quality slow to anger is applied to God no less than nine times in the Old Testament. People think the old God of the Old Testament is an angry God, but the Old Testament actually says God is slow to get angry. God doesn't fly off at the handle at the first mistake that you make. It takes a lot to get God angry. The Apostle Peter reminds us that the Lord is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. What defines God is his patience towards us. The fact that he's slow to get angry. And we see God's patience in Jesus. Jesus is patient. And it's not that Jesus doesn't get angry with people. He does, but it takes a lot to get Jesus angry. We, we, he's incredibly patient with people. We see that in how he deals with his disciples. They, they annoyed, well, would have annoyed him over and over again with the things they said, the things they did, their lack of faith. And yet Jesus is so gracious to them, so patient with them. Jesus takes the time to help a widow who has just lost a son. He stops preaching, not to berate the men that lowered this guy down in front of him, but to heal his friend, their friend. He stops his busy schedule to heal a woman who was ceremoniously unclean. He takes the time to speak to Zacchaeus, not to confront his many sins, but to dine at his house. When Simon wonders why Jesus would let a sinful woman touch him, Jesus takes the time to tell him why. Jesus isn't quick to get angry. He's incredibly patient with people. In fact, Jesus is incredibly patient with you. We often think of Jesus as being frustrated with us or annoyed at us or even angry at us. But I want to encourage you to see Jesus as being patient with you. It's not that he ignores your sin, but that he deals with your sin one bit at a time. Like Paul says, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Jesus is patiently working in your life to grow you a bit more like him every day. Jesus isn't up there throwing his hands in the air saying, that's it, I give up, this guy is too hard. You are a long-term project for a very patient Christ. And the question I want to ask you this Christmas is, are you patient? Christmas gives us plenty of opportunities to grow in our patience. From long queues, crowded shops, extra traffic and annoying relatives who love telling stories that you wish they'd all forgotten. 
I love to think I'm being patient when I bite my tongue and just tap my foot in the stalls. But that's not patience, that's just suppressing my annoyance. Instead of getting angry or annoyed this Christmas, be patient with people. Let me share a couple of proverbs. A hot-tempered man stirs up dissension, but a patient man calms a quarrel. A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. And Paul writes, In your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Don't let the devil get a foothold in your life this Christmas. Be patient with people. Be slow to get angry. What sort of love are you exhibiting this Christmas? Are you exhibiting the love of Jesus? So exhibit A, love is patient. Exhibit B, love is kind. Kindness is one of those things that are, is hard to define. Apparently, this is the first example of the verb to be kind in Greek literature. If you go through all the ancient documents, this is the first time you'll find the verb to be kind. Not that they didn't have kindness, it just wasn't very common. Kindness is being friendly, it's being generous, it's being considerate of others. It's ringing a friend and just ask how they're going. It's bringing a meal over to your neighbour. It's writing a note to encourage someone. It's helping your elderly neighbour with their yard work. It's saying thank you to the person at the counter when you pay. And like with the previous characteristic, it's no surprise that God is kind. When God revealed himself to Moses, he said, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Surrounding God's patience is God's mercy, his grace and his loving kindness. That phrase, loving kindness, uh, sorry, steadfast love, is often translated as loving kindness. God is defined by his kindness. In fact, God abounds in loving kindness. Paul asks us, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? God isn't just patient with you, he is kind towards you. Paul says, God showed the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. God shows his kindness to us in Jesus. Jesus is the kindness of God. So it's no surprise that Jesus is incredibly kind towards people towards the poor and the needy, towards women and towards children, towards the sick and the ostracised. Paul talks about when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared. And he's talking about the appearance of Jesus. In Jesus, we see God's kindness towards sinners. God came down from heaven in the person of Jesus to meet your great spiritual need. Jesus came down not to help mow your lawns, but to help lift us out of despair. Jesus came down not to make us dinner, but to be the bread of life. Jesus came down not to write a note of encouragement, but to encourage our souls through the gift of the Holy Spirit. You are probably here this morning because of the kindness of Jesus. You deserve God's anger but instead you have received his kindness in Jesus. And the question I want to ask you this Christmas is, are you kind? This Christmas, will you reach out to others with the kindness of Jesus? Will you do something for your neighbour, not because they've done something to you, but just to share with them the kindness of Jesus? Will you take the time to thank someone, not because they did such an amazing job, but just because they served you? Will you be liberal with encouraging smiles? Will you treat other people not as an inconvenience, but as someone made in the image of God? 
This Christmas, will you exhibit the love of Jesus? So exhibit A, love is patient. Exhibit B, love is kind. Exhibit C, love rejoices in the truth. We live in a post-truth world. We live in a world where truth has become relative. That whatever you think is true is true for you. But is that actually true? Try to work that out in your own head. I think the real problem is that that people don't want to know the truth. They don't want to face the truth about themselves. It reminds me of the line in the movie, A Few Good Men, you can't handle the truth. We think making up the truth will make us feel better about ourselves. Often, we don't want people to know the truth about us because we're ashamed of it. But Jesus says the truth will set you free. The truth is necessary for authentic relationships. I want to look at three important truths that we can rejoice about today. The truth one is that you are a sinner. There's a really telling story in John's Gospel where a bunch of religious leaders drag an adulterous woman before him and says, the law says she should be stoned, what do you say? And Jesus says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And John says, when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. While the motive of these guys is horrendous, they at least knew the truth about themselves, that they were sinners. Paul says there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The truth that you are a sinner is hard to hear. We don't want to hear it. But if we're ever going to have a relationship with God, it starts with this truth about ourselves, that we're sinners. Truth two. Jesus came to save sinners. Paul writes, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Jesus was born to save sinners like you and me. Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The truth is, Jesus came to die on the cross for your sin and for mine. The third truth is that in Jesus you have been made right with God. Paul says, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That word justified means we've been declared or made right with God. Jesus' perfect righteousness covers our unrighteousness. Jesus' perfect obedience covers our disobedience. The truth is that God sent his only son into the world that all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The truth is that through faith in Jesus, you can become God's child. That is the truth that we celebrate at Christmas. That though we are sinners, Jesus came to save sinners and to make us right with God. In fact, Jesus himself rejoiced in the truth. Luke writes, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Jesus rejoiced that God had revealed the truth to his children. The wise and understanding people of, in this world can't see it. They can't see that they are sinners who need salvation. They can't see the significance of Christmas and of Easter. They can't see their need to be reconciled with God. But Jesus has revealed that truth to us. I hope he's revealed that truth to you this Christmas. Because Jesus rejoices when you accept the truth of the gospel. 
Jesus tells three parables in Luke 15 about heaven rejoicing over one sinner who repents. But if you put Jesus in that story, he's not in there indifferent. He's in there rejoicing with everyone else over a sinner who repents. Jesus rejoices when you accept the gospel. So I want to ask you this Christmas, do you rejoice in the truth? Do you rejoice when God reveals the truth about yourself? Do you rejoice when God humbles you before his throne of grace? And do you rejoice when God brings sinners into our church, that they too might hear the gospel, that they too might humble themselves before their heavenly Father? that they too might be saved through faith in Jesus. Are you exhibiting the love of Jesus this Christmas? So far in our trial of love, we've looked at three evidences of love. Exhibit A, love is patient. Exhibit B, love is kind. Exhibit C, love rejoices in the truth. Well, the next four things I'm going to combine into exhibit D. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. What does it mean that love bears all things? The truth is that when you love someone, you will put up with a great deal. I don't know if you're married, but if you're married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes you have to put up with a lot from your spouse. We don't love people because of their faults. Rather, because we love them, we bear with their faults. In the same way, Jesus loved us despite our faults and our failings. Paul says God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were messed up, while we were ignoring God and doing life in our own way, Christ died for us. Peter says Jesus loved us so much, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Jesus bore our sins your sins in his body on the tree. Jesus bore all the wrong things you've ever thought, ever said or ever done on the cross. And if he bore all of that for you, how can you not bear a little from others? Peter writes this, he says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. When you love someone, you will bear all sorts of stuff. Secondly, what does Paul mean by love believes all things? You know, that sounds like something a really gullible person would do. You know, a contemporary wisdom says, don't believe everything on the internet, don't believe everything you watch on YouTube, don't believe everything you hear on TV, and you shouldn't. Because a lot of it's rubbish. Paul couldn't possibly mean believe anything anyone says to you. He's only just told us to rejoice in the truth. He tells Titus to teach what accords with sound doctrine. Don't teach anything, teach the truth. He tells the Galatians, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. As far as Paul is concerned, we shouldn't believe everything. So what does he mean, love believes all things? Well, the NIV translates this phrase as love always trusts. And I think it's a good translation. It's not that we believe everything and anything, but that what we do believe, we keep believing. If we really love Jesus, if we really believe in him, We will keep believing in him, no matter what happens. Jesus says, the one who endures to the end will be saved. It's not those who used to trust in Jesus who will be saved, but the ones who keep trusting in Jesus who will be saved. If we love Jesus, all the things that we believe about him, we will keep believing all those things. Thirdly, Paul says, love hopes all things. Again, this isn't hoping that you will win the lotto or find the spouse of your dreams. This is biblical hope. This is the hope of Hebrews 11. 
Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen or not seen. The thing that we hope for, we are assured of. We may not have seen the thing we're hoping for. We haven't seen heaven yet. But we're convinced that what God promises will come to pass. As if we had seen it with our own eyes. Because we love God and we know that he loves us, we have no doubt that what he promises is true. You see, Jesus didn't just come down to die on the cross. He came down to defeat death and to rise victorious and enter into heaven before us. In Jesus, we have the hope of heaven. He's gone before us. He's the first fruits. In Jesus, we have the hope of eternal life because he rose again from the dead. But not only did God's love come down at Christmas, Paul says it came down at Pentecost as well. He writes, Hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. When God's love has been poured into our hearts, you can hope with complete conviction that all things will work out for your good. Love hopes all things. Finally, Paul says, love endures all things. If you were to choose the greatest characteristic of love, what would you pick? Well, if you've been watching lots of Hollywood movies, you'd say something silly or deeply romantic or macho. But it's interesting that Paul picks the greatest, the last, he says, is endurance. Paul says that real love does not give up. Love keeps going. Love keeps loving no matter what. What makes love really impressive is that it endures. It endures sleepless nights. It endures endlessly repeating yourself to your kids. It endures constant eye rolling. You can tell that I'm a parent of teenagers. It endures the times when you don't know how it's all going to work out. It endures, to quote your wedding vows, plenty and want, sorrow and joy, sickness and health. When a weightlifter stands with the barbell above his head, he's not just standing there, he's standing there under tremendous pressure. All that weight is bearing down on him. That's what love does. It remains standing under tremendous pressure. Paul says, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Love stands firm until the end. When Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, his sweat was like drops of blood. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death and yet he prays, your will be done. Because he loved you, Jesus endured the cross for you. Under tremendous pressure, Jesus held out his arms on the cross and endured God's righteous anger against your sin. Because he loved you, he endured all things for you. That's the love that God has poured out into your heart through the Holy Spirit. A love that can endure all things. A love that will remain standing even under tremendous pressure. The love that came down at Christmas is a love that bears all things. A love that keeps believing. A love that keeps hoping. A love that keeps enduring. Is that the sort of love that you are exhibiting this Christmas? Brothers and sisters, the evidence is before you. Love isn't some soppy sentimental thing. It's not self-serving like the love Jordan Peterson talks about. It's love that is incredibly patient. It's a love that is incredibly kind. It's a love that rejoices in the truth. It's a love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things and endures all things. It's what came down that first Christmas in the person of Jesus. It's what he showed us when he laid down his life for us on the cross. And it's what you and I have been called to show others. 
God exhibited His love for you in Jesus. And He calls you to exhibit that same love to your spouse and to your kids, to your family and friends, to your neighbours and even to complete strangers. Are you exhibiting the love of Jesus this Christmas? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love that you sent down into this world in the person of Jesus. Lord, in Jesus, we see your patience with us. Lord, you are slow to get angry. And we see that, saw that in Jesus' life and ministry as well. And Lord, I pray that this Christmas, the world would see it in us. That, Lord, we would be patient. That we would be slow to get angry. And, Lord, the love that came down at Christmas was a love that was incredibly kind. Lord, we see your kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. And, Lord, we pray that as he was so kind to us, we would be kind to others. Lord, this Christmas, may our lives be marked by incredible kindness as we help those around us, as we are generous and thoughtful. Lord, help us to exhibit the kindness of Jesus. Lord, the love that came down at Christmas rejoiced in the truth. Lord, it rejoiced in the awareness of our awareness that we are sinners. It rejoiced in the fact that we repented of our sin and that we put our faith in Jesus who came to save sinners. Lord, we rejoice in the fact that we have been reconciled with you. And Lord, may we rejoice in sharing that gospel with other people. Lord, may we rejoice as other people come to a saving knowledge of your son Jesus. And Lord, the love that came down at Christmas, it bore all things, it believed all things, it hoped all things, it endured all things. And Lord, may our love be the same. Lord, may we bear with much from others. Lord, may we keep believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we keep hoping for the eternal life that you have promised us. And Lord, may we keep enduring that we would never give up in our love for other people. Lord, this Christmas, may you fill us with the love of Jesus. This Christmas, may we exhibit his love to the world. Amen.